All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, depending on where in the world you're joining us from today. And welcome to the world's most exciting classroom. So uh, for those of you who were able to tune in last week, we did a live event from the Ooster Scale Day before it left Plymouth Harbor and began its incredible two-year voyage following Charles Darwin's voyage of the Beagle. Now, today is going to be absolutely jam-packed, and I'm not kidding when I say that. We have live videos, live experiments. We have contests, Kahoot quizzes, Q&A sessions, a beam in from the ship, a visit to the National Marine Aquarium in Plymouth. We have so much going on today. We're going to launch our first experiment for classrooms. It is going to be an absolutely amazing event. Now, for anybody who's joining us for the very first time, this expedition, the Darwin 200, will be following Charles Darwin's voyage of the Beagle for the next two years with three incredible things going on. There is the uh, global experiments. So things like plastic sampling and coral reef surveys and marine mammal surveys will be happening all over the world. We'll also have our Darwin 200 leaders. So 200 incredible youth from around the world doing amazing things in conservation, joining the ships at the different ports and getting some training to return home with and become the next generation of conservation leaders in their countries. And then of course, the world's most exciting classroom, which today we will have a little focus on exploring coral reefs. So where is the Ooster Scale Day now? I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna share that with you right now because uh, the ship is actually in a very cool location, making its way to Tenerife uh, in the Canary Islands. So you can see here where we left Plymouth, you can see all these little points as the ship is making its way down towards Tenerife. And then what's really cool about this interactive map on the website is photos are being uploaded here in real time. So you can see little photos, little video clips of what's going on on the ship. Let's just pick one here. Uh, so this map is so cool. It's so interactive uh, and you can explore along with those who are on uh, the Oosterschel Day right now. All right. Let's get into the action. So um, I should mention that next week we will be uh, live from uh, the Ooster Scale Day in Tenerife, which is gonna be a lot of fun. And actually I do have a little clip here that I would love to share of the ship leaving Plymouth. So it was quite an exciting morning. Uh, a couple hundred people showed up at the side of the dock to see the ship off. And I mean, I don't know if there's anything more exciting uh, than watching a beautiful historic tall ship like this leaving harbor. So I can only imagine, uh, you know, what Darwin must have been thinking as he was on uh, the HMS Beagle and leaving Plymouth. You can see we had a beautiful clear day uh, for the Ooster Scale Day to be leaving uh, the port. And we'll just watch this for a little moment here. You can see the a few chase ships following along, wishing well. You can see the beautiful sun shot here. They're just starting to raise the sails on board of the ship. Um, I can imagine the excitement that the, the first passengers were feeling uh, as their first leg of this journey uh, was starting here. So absolutely incredible as the sun moves behind those sails. All right, so I'm going to bring in now, we have joining us from Poole in the UK, we have Stuart McPherson joining us. He is the expedition leader for the Darwin 200, and he is going to queue up a really exciting video. Uh, we have to share about some of Darwin's discoveries uh, along his voyage. So let's bring Stu in with us this morning. Hey, Stu, how are you? Hello, Joe. It's lovely to speak to you. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's great to be coming to you live from Canada. We've got you in the UK uh, and the ship somewhere on the Atlantic. That's right. And every week for the next 100 weeks, we've got sessions like this. So we really, really hope you guys watching will take part in our experiments and our projects every week, nonstop, as the ship goes around the world for the next two years. So we've got a little introduction video now explaining who Charles Darwin was and what he did. Hello everyone and welcome to the Darwin Studio. Our mission is to put adventure back into science and learning. My name is Stuart McPherson and over the next 100 weeks we're going to be exploring the natural world and the research and discoveries of Charles Darwin. Well, firstly, who is Charles Darwin and what did he do? You might have seen this photo of Darwin before. 
He's famous as the man that sailed around the world on the ship HMS Beagle. It's that voyage which our Darwin 200 project is currently following. Our ship is sailing in Charles Darwin's wake and is currently off Tenerife in the Canary Islands. Darwin went on to write a book called On the Origin of Species, which put forward the theory of evolution. This has been described as the biggest single thought in the history of human thinking, and it changed our understanding of our place in the natural world. But he was only 22 years old when he stepped aboard HMS Beagle, and evolution wasn't the only subject that he studied. And during that voyage, he studied a whole manner, a whole range of animals and wrote a series of publications on the zoology that he observed during the Beagle voyage. He then went on to study coral reefs and how coral atolls are formed. So this is a very important work that provided the basis of our understanding. We've got several experiments that you can do about that subject coming up. He wrote a series of publications on the geology of volcanic islands and other subjects relating to the geology he observed. He then spent many years studying barnacles. Now this might seem like a strange subject to, to study, but barnacles were very curious. In the early 19th century, people didn't really know where they had evolved from and which group of animals they belonged to. Darwin studied these animals and traced their fossil record back through millions and millions of years and noticed and observed and documented how they had evolved from crustaceans that had become stuck to rocks using their filter feeding apparatus and their limbs to get their food from the water. So this was a very important study that provided the evidence for his evolutionary thinking. He then went on to, to write this extremely important book on the origin of species and this changed our understanding of everything in the natural world. This is one of the most important books written in history. He then focused on plants and did a series of publications looking at the fertilization and pollination of orchids and other plants. So several books that also then covered uh, the power of movement in certain plants and the stimuli that, that caused plants to move in different ways. He then went on to publish this book, Insectivorous Plants. After 15 years of study, he accumulated evidence to show that certain plants can capture and kill insects and drive nutrients. So he literally founded the theory of carnivorous plants. Towards the end of his life, he wrote two books on, on humans, on people, looking firstly at how expressions in humans and animals convey emotions. So for example, if I smile and I'm happy, I express that emotion, or if I'm sad, how that expresses anger or, or aggression. He wrote another book called The Descent of Man, and then moved on to study a very humble subject in the later years of his life, looking at how earthworms create soil. And we've got an experiment dedicated to this coming up. Over the next 100 weeks, we've got one experiment a week beaming out to you so you can replicate these in your school or in your classroom. In the following sessions, we'll present the results of those experiments and award prizes for those that take part. So we really hope you'll join our program of experiments and activities. Our first experiment concerns ocean acidification and the impact of increasing acidity on coral and mollusks. Next week, we look at the ideas behind the theory of evolution and natural selection. Then coming up, we've got carnivorous plants, Komodo dragons, and a whole range of other subjects. To explain each experiment, we're launching an instruction video and a downloadable PDF with all of the information you need to replicate each experiment at home or in your classroom. Then you've got two weeks to upload your results before we announce the winners. We really hope that you'll take part in these experiments and enjoy learning about Charles Darwin's research and discoveries. Good luck, and for more information, visit www.darwin200.com for details. All right, so very exciting to learn a little bit about Charles Darwin's uh, research and the work that came out of his incredible five years on the HMS Beagle. Truly did change the world with many of his findings in biology and, of course, the theory of natural selection. Now, I've got a special treat for today. I mentioned that today's event is going to focus on exploring coral reefs. And I can't think of a better place to go 
than to beam in to the with the Ocean Conservation Trust at the National Marine Aquarium in Plymouth in the United Kingdom. And we're lucky to have Jess joining us today, who's a schools officer and is going to take us a little bit into the world uh, of coral. So let me bring Jess in live with us. Hey, Jess, how you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. Hi, see All right, Jess, it's great to have you with us. We'll let you take over for a little bit. Hey, brilliant. So I'm here today in our ocean lab in the National Marine Aquarium. And our ocean lab is where our biologists do all kinds of different science every day to make sure the conditions are right for our animals, keeping them happy and healthy. But there's a particular part of the ocean lab that I want to show you today. Come with me. This is our coral propagation area or coral prop for short. Hi, Heather. Hi, Jess. Have you got a few minutes to talk to us about coral? Yeah, I should have time. Excellent. That's a nice coincidence. <laughs> Brilliant. So, um, Heather, first of all, can you introduce yourself to everyone, please? Um, hi, I'm Heather. I'm a biologist here at the National Marine Aquarium. I work primarily with corals and with native British species. Fantastic. Thank you. OK, so working with corals, why is it that we're growing corals here in our lab then, Heather? So primarily we grow corals here to supply our display tanks. It's a lot more sustainable than having to get corals from the wild. Plus it means we can do a bit of research into seeing what conditions our corals grow best in and what foods they like the best. That makes a lot of sense. So it sounds like they're a bit more complicated than we might realise. So you're up now for helping me to explain a little bit about what they are? Yes, I think I am. <laughs> Excellent. Brilliant. So a lot of people get a bit confused about this. They're not sure whether a coral is a rock, a plant, or an animal. I wonder what you guys think at home. Um, but if you have said any of those three, you're a little bit correct, aren't you, Heather? Yeah. Because actually, a coral starts off with a teeny tiny animal, a bit like a jellyfish or a sea anemone. And do correct me if I'm wrong with any of this, Heather. Yeah? <laughs> So imagine, guys, you can do it with me if you like. We've got a little jellyfish hand and it's just wafting through the ocean. And our coral polyps are a little bit like a jellyfish. And that little polyp is going to drift through the ocean until it comes to rest on top of somewhere hard like a rock with its tentacles upside, waving up into the sea. Now, Heather, I've got a little something for you to help us to demonstrate. Lovely. Okay. So <laughs> if I pop that on you like that, my hand. how's that? Oh, lovely. I'm in it now. Isn't that beautiful? She looks very nice. So you've got your wonderful coral polyp tentacles here. Now, the thing is, though, life as a polyp, it's a little bit dangerous, isn't it? All kinds of animals would like to eat bad fish. It's a no, no. It's very dangerous to be a coral polyp all out in the ocean on your own. Yeah. But you're very clever, aren't you, Heather? Oh, yeah. So what she does is she creates a very special substance called calcium carbonate. And it is a little bit like the sort of thing that we would imagine it would be. Calcium being the sort of things that we have in our teeth and in our bones, and it helps keep them strong and hard. So what she does is she creates this calcium carbonate and makes a lovely little protective cup for herself all around her to protect her. Ah, uh, that's a relief, huh? Yeah, what a relief. <laughs> so, that's great news for Heather. But the thing is, corals, then the polyps, they're not made to live alone. They get really lonely, very lonely. The good news is that Heather has yet another superpower. Our poor polyp, Heather, has another superpower. And what she can do is she can create another version of her, a clone, an almost identical version, okay? So, I'm gonna count you in. And Heather is gonna do something called budding, where she creates that clone. You ready for this? Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> ready? Three, two, one. Ta-da! Hi. Hi, <laughs> hello, Will. We've got Will here, who is a, a, a budded polyp that has been created. Um, very excellent, Will. Thank you. Um, but you're not—you're not just a coral polyp, are you, Will? No, I'm 
Will, I'm a lead biologist here at the National Marine Aquarium. Um, I work really closely with these corals and I work in our biozone section, which is our Indo-Pacific um, tropical section of the aquarium. Brilliant. Okay, so we've got some really useful, helpful, important people here that I've managed to dress up and make them look silly. So really good job and thank you so much to you guys. But the good news is that we've now got more than one polyp together. They are joined, they're in a group and we call it a colony. All corals like to be in a colony. And what happens eventually is they will join together, create more and more polyps and that calcium carbonate structure becomes a really large detailed base, somewhere that those corals, the polyps, can live in to keep them all really nice and safe. But you guys who are watching, you might notice that there's a difference between the coral skeleton as it would be, it's not a real skeleton, but the base here that I'm holding in my hand made of the calcium carbonate and what we can see here in the tank. If you've noticed, that the ones in the tank are all lovely and colorful, then you've worked out what I was thinking. So these corals, they actually have beautiful colors on their surface. Wonder what that's about. Now, our wonderful volunteer coral polyps have the same. Your lovely tentacles here. Oh, this beautiful yellow color, very fetching. And that's because inside and on the surface of those corals are tiny little plants called zooxanthellae. Those zooxanthellae, guys, they're pretty useful. Yeah, they're really, really important. Um, they can provide up to 90% of the energy that a coral actually uses, uh, basically through uh, what's called photosynthesis, so getting the energy from the sun. Brilliant. So it'd be quite important then that these corals are in shallow water and the sunlight can get through to them. Yeah, really important. Okay, fantastic. You guys spend a lot of time working with coral. I wonder, what are your favorite parts about coral? What's your favorite thing about them? Well, I just like the diversity of them, like the mm -hmm. different colors, um, just the sheer variety that we have here. Um, they're, they're just really interesting animals. Um, and yeah, I just love to work with them. Brilliant, thank you Will. How about you Heather? Um, my favorite thing about corals is probably the way that, the way that the Suzanne belly work under different lights, they can look different colors, oh, yeah. which is why our corals here in the aquarium might look a little bit different than corals you find out in the wild. Fantastic. These, so these ones over here, these orange ones, are they anything special? Yeah, those are called uh, zoanthids uh, and these are actually quite dangerous. Um, they, can, <laughs> yeah, they can be uh, toxic if they get disturbed. Uh, so that's another really interesting thing about corals is um, they do actually, they, ca they can sting and they can produce toxins. Uh, you can think of them a little bit like anemones. Very nice, thank you. Okay, so we touched on it a little bit, um, but you guys really love corals and I wonder why is it important that we protect and conserve them. Heather, would you like to go first this time? Um, yeah, coral reefs around the world are an amazing ecosystem. And even though they cover less than 1% of the sea floor, they actually provide in one way or another nursery, shelter, or food for around 25% of marine species. Wow, gosh. So without coral reefs, a lot of our marine species would be in real yeah, trouble, huh? exactly. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, is there anything else that we, you think we should know about how important they are? Um, yeah, they can actually be important to humanity as well, um, because if you think of the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, um, it acts as a, a, well, a barrier uh, that protects the coastline from storms, uh, from tsunamis, that sort of thing. So really quite important for coastal communities in that way as well. Okay, fantastic. Lovely. So I think that is all we have time for here at the moment at the Ocean Conservation Trust. Um, but I just want to say a big thank you to you guys, Heather and Will, for your help. And a thank you to you guys for watching. And we look forward to showing you more exciting science in the future. Back to you, Joe. All right. Absolutely amazing. Well, just a huge shout out to you. Thank you for being such an incredible host. Thank you so much uh, to Will and Heather there behind the scenes uh, and being wonderful demonstrators of those different stages of the coral.
Now, something that we're going to do special during every live event is we're going to do something called a Kahoot quiz. And so this is a chance for students out there to test their knowledge uh, about what they just learned and a chance to win a prize. So for today's Kahoot quiz, there will be a 50 pound um, gift card for the winner who gets the most points. So it's really important that if you are the winner, you send an email here to explore ebtsoyp at gmail.com. And we will make sure that we get that prize to you. Now, Kahoot might be new to some people who are joining us today, and that's okay. Today's going to be a nice warm up. We'll do this Kahoot session uh, live together today, uh, and then we will be ready to do them uh, together in the future as well. So I'm going to share my screen here and give you all the instructions that you need uh, to join us in this Kahoot event. So here we go. Let's get a little volume on this here because we've got a little bit of music. All right. So you need to visit Kahoot.it. You can see the websites right up there at the top, www.kahoot.it. And then it's going to ask you for a PIN number. Today's game PIN is 684346. Now, if you have a mobile device like a tablet or your phone, you can scan that QR code up there at the top and it's going to bring you right uh, front and center uh, into the event. And I can see we have uh, hopefully some students or some joining from home today. Uh, you're going to get an auto generated animal name. Now, today's quiz has five questions. You have 20 seconds to answer each question. They are true and false, uh, and they are multiple choice today. So I'm gonna give maybe 30 seconds here to get uh, a few more into the Kahoot with us. Um, you can use this on your device. If you're in a classroom, uh, your teacher can join at the front. If you don't have one-to-one -one technology at your seats, you can put it up at the front of the classroom and you can shout out the answers to your teacher and you can join in that way. If you have devices right at your seat or right at home, you can scan that QR code or visit kahoot.it and put in this game pin 684346. And all the questions today, if you are paying attention to Jess and her wonderful lesson uh, on Coral today, you will be ready to answer these questions. If you get the right answer, you're getting points. If you put in the right answer and you do it really quickly, you get even more points. If you put in that wrong answer, but you're faster than everybody else, we got nothing for you. You have to get the answer right uh, and you have to do as quickly as you can to get as many points as you can. All right, maybe 10 more seconds before we go live. We've got the Space Sable, the Snowy Griffin, the Royal Pelican, the Genius Possum joining us today. And I think, oh, a few more sneaking in. I think we're ready to take this first Kahoot live uh, and see who comes out on top. Uh, and wins today's prize. So here we go. We're gonna count you in with three seconds here and then be ready for that first question. All right, it is a multiple choice. Where is the National Marine Aquarium located? Was it in Poole, Plymouth, Portsmouth, or London? Where is the National Marine Aquarium located? Poole, Plymouth, Portsmouth, or in London. You have five more seconds to lock in your answers. All right, good job crew. Most went with Plymouth. That means that the great sloth is in first place, but everything is close. We are just getting started and there's lots of room for movement on that leaderboard. We have a true and false question. Growing coral at the aquarium is less sustainable for the displays. Is that true? or is that false? Growing the or coral at the aquarium is less sustainable uh, than actually taking it from the wild. So is that true or is that false? You have five more seconds to lock in that answer. All right, good job crew. That's absolutely false. It is more sustainable to be able to grow and propagate the coral at the aquarium to use in the displays than to be actually taking the aquarium or the coral from the wild and transporting it uh, to the aquarium. Let's see what that did to our leaderboard. We had some movement, but the great sloth is still holding on strong. So let's get to another multiple choice question. Coral can be considered a rock, a plant, an animal, or all of the above. So coral can be considered rock, plant, 
animal or all of the above? All right, we had a little bit of movement here. Most went with animal, which is true. It can definitely be considered an animal, but with its symbiotic relationship with algae, you can, can be considered a plant-like. And then of course that calcium carbonate structure, that skeleton that creates over thousands of years, building up and up and up, uh, gives it kind of that rock-like quality. So all of the above, you can kind of think uh, of a coral. Let's see if that shook things up a little. It did, the inspired mouse has taken that top spot. So let's get on to our next question. It's another true and false question. Calcium carbonate can be used to create a protective cup for the coral polyp. Is that true or is that false? Calcium carbonate can be used to create a little protective cup uh, for that small coral polyp. You've got about five seconds to get your answer in. True or false, is calcium carbonate that all important material? All right, good job crew. That is absolutely true. And our experiment coming up right after this is going to deal with that. So stay tuned. All right, inspired mouse holding on, but we have one more question uh, to finish things off. So what is a group of coral or a collection of coral called? Is it a school? Is it a crash? Is it a colony? Or is it an aggregate? So what is a group of coral, a collection of coral polyps called? School, a crash, a colony, or an aggregate? You have a few more seconds to lock in that answer and we are gonna take a look at our podium. All right, good job crew, it is absolutely a colony. Let's jump to our podium, let's see what happened. Third place, we've got the diplomat possum, good work. Second place, we've got the great sloth. And in first place, we have the inspired mouse able to hold on for those last few questions. All right. Well, great work, everyone. This is a Kahoot quiz. This is what we're going to do in every live event with the world's most exciting classroom. There will be prizes available. Uh, so let's come back from that screen share and let's make sure to remind uh, our winner, the inspired mouse, that if you send a message to ebtsoyp at gmail.com, we will get you set up with today's prize. So thank you so much uh, for taking part in our live Kahoot quiz today. Now, before we head out and beam over to the Ooster Scale Day for a live connection from the ship, we are gonna talk about experiment number one, focused on ocean acidification. So the instructions for this will be found on the Darwin 200 website. So if you're not able to grab the instructions here, you can find those instructions on the Darwin 200 website. There will also be an instruction PDF uh, on the Darwin 200 website so that you can replicate this experiment in your classroom. And then best of all, if you upload your results within two weeks, there is a chance to win one of three 50 pound uh, prizes, gift cards that you can use in your classroom. So again, the Darwin 200 website, you can find the recording of the experiment, you can find the instruction PDF and then the details you need within two weeks to upload your results. So let's take a look at this very first experiment. Uh, and then hopefully we get these happening in the back of classrooms all over the UK, Canada, the United States and all over the world. So here we go. Let's take a look at this first experiment. Do you know what your bones are made out of? They're made of calcium carbonate, in common with animals right the way around the world, from birds to butterflies. Calcium carbonate is especially important for marine life because it's soluble, so it dissolves in water. That makes it very easy for marine organisms to absorb it into their bodies. So animals from crustaceans to mollusks to corals use it for their exoskeletons or their bones. Unfortunately, a big problem today is that the pollution that we're creating is increasing the acidity of the world's oceans. This is a problem because calcium carbonate reacts with acid, so it has an impact on the life that lives in the world's oceans. 
today's experiment is going to explore that very subject. For this experiment, you need about 200 milliliters of white vinegar. This is available at supermarkets across the world. It's also known as acetic acid. It's used for cooking purposes. Your parents might have some at home in your kitchen, or maybe your teacher has got some in the science lab at your school. Be a little bit careful because this stings if you get it in your eyes, and it also doesn't taste very nice. So wash your hands after doing this experiment to make sure you, you don't get in contact with any of this vinegar. You also need about 200 milliliters of water. This can be seawater, rainwater, or tap water. The purpose of this is to use it as a control against the vinegar to check your results. You also need some seashells. Hopefully some of your classmates have been to the beach recently or on holiday and collected some shells that they can spare. Ask your teacher for some pH strips to test the acidity of the vinegar and the water. And then you also need some scales to measure the weight of the seashells before and after the experiment. Okay, let's get started. Step one, measure the weight of a shell. This particular one here weighs 6.6 grams. So we'll put this in a beaker labeled vinegar. That's right, 6.6 .6 grams on the front of it. If you want to, you can put in other shells, but just remember to make sure that you know which shell you've weighed. So I'm gonna put in lots of little shells, which are different from that big one that we just weighed. Then just repeat the process for water. So let's put this shell in our beaker for water, and this one weighs 5.8 grams. So this is a little bit smaller. The difference doesn't matter at all. Let's put that one in here. We'll add a few small shells as well. Step two, we've got to measure the pH of the two different liquids and see how acidic they are. So here's a little pH strip. Let's put it in the vinegar. Well, look, that's turned bright orange. If we then compare that against the pH color chart, look, we can see that's easily pH four, even maybe getting towards pH three. So it's very acidic. Let's repeat the process for the water. Oh, that hasn't changed color at all. Let's compare that against the color chart. Yep, that's pretty much neutral. That's about pH seven. So that's not very acidic. So we've got a good contrast between our two liquids. Step three, it's time to do the experiment. So very carefully take your vinegar and pour it onto the shells. If you wait a couple of seconds, then look really carefully, you should see something happen. Then our control experiment, let's pour in the water and see what happens there. You then have to be really patient and leave the two beakers alone. But if you look very, very carefully, you'll see something is happening. After waiting 24 hours, it's time to take the shells out of the liquids. Let's start with the one in vinegar. So put that on a paper towel and dry it very carefully so it's completely dry because the weight of the liquid can impact the experiment. And then you've got to measure its weight again. So this is now saying it is 5.4 grams. So if you remember, we weighed that shell and put it in and it weighed 6.6 .6 grams. It now weighs 5.4 grams. So it's reduced in weight by 1.2 grams. Let's do the same for the shell that we put in water. It was this big shell down here at the bottom, if I remember correctly. Here it is. Let's dry it again. And let's weigh it. Ah, this shell is 5.8 grams. So it is exactly the same weight as it was when we put it in the water. 
It's 5.8, so it hasn't changed at all. So one shell has reduced in weight, one shell hasn't. Why do you think that is? So the shell that we put in the acidic vinegar has decreased in weight. However, the shell that we put in water has stayed exactly the same. Discuss your results with your teacher or your parents and try and answer three research questions. You've got to upload the answers to these three questions to our website within the next two weeks in order to win prizes. The first question is what's happened and why? Why do you think we've seen a difference between the two shells? Remember, there's a difference in the liquids that we put them into. The second research question is what do you think the gas was that was released from the shells? Remember all those little bubbles? What was that gas? There's a clue in the words calcium carbonate. Discuss this question with your teachers or your parents at home. And for the last question, think what impact increasing the acidity of the world's oceans has on marine life. Those crustaceans, mollusks and coral. What impact would the increasing acidity of the world's oceans have on the calcium carbonate of these organisms? And what can we do to reduce the impact of ocean acidification? Upload your answers to the Darwin 200 website within the next two weeks for the chance to win exciting prizes. Remember, an instruction PDF can be downloaded from our website. Good luck and see you in two weeks for the answers. All right, so Stu did a great job there reminding everybody what we need to do now. Uh, and that is, you can find the recording of the instructions, the video we just watched on the Darwin 200 website. You can find the instructions, the PDF instruction for doing the experiment in your classroom. And then you have two weeks to upload your results for a chance at one of those three 50 pound prizes. So an amazing experiment, lots to think about and research this week so that you can get your answers in. Now, this is uh, a moment I've been waiting for. I'm so excited for this part of the event. We are gonna beam live to the Oostersky Day on the Atlantic Ocean, making its way to Tenerife. We're using some incredible satellite technology to make this happen. I see some smiling faces there waiting for us. Let me bring them in here live with us. Tom, Rodri, Grant, how are we doing today? All good, all good. How was our connection? The connection is beautiful. I see your smiling faces and I see the ocean awesome. behind you. <laughs> Perfect. We're Perfect. swimming. Well, let's, uh, let's get this started here. First of all, I'm going to make you full screen. Can you do a little pan around? We'd love to see where you yeah, are. Yeah, right no I saw Nadia there in the background, our wonderful ballooning spider researcher. Very cool. All right. Absolutely incredible. So you're hitting, I think today is your 10th day uh, at sea. I'd love to hear a little bit about how the experience has been so far. Uh, yeah, no, it's been awesome. Yeah, we've had lots of wind a lot of the time, but it's been coming and going. But yeah, now we're sailing away down the coast of Portugal. Uh, just south of Madeira. All right. Well, and I know, yeah. All right. And I know you've been having some really uh, special sightings along the way. I'm going to share a little video clip here uh, of this uh, northern fin whale. Tell us a little bit about this wonderful, amazing creature that you guys saw. So we were lucky enough to see a pod of northern fin whales uh, just in the Bay of Biscay, only on our second full day at sea. It was really amazing. Uh, they stayed with us for about 30 minutes. We were able to get this amazing drone footage that you're watching. And it's really cool because the species is an example of one that, you know, was really decimated by whaling uh, during the, 20, the first half of the 20th century. And uh, they're they're on the rise, but you know, still not the numbers that would have been around uh, when the, the beagle was making its way around. All right, amazing! Second largest uh, whale in the world. Who was piloting the drone? Uh, that was me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As soon as we saw them, we got the drone straight out of the storage and put it straight up. Oh, that's absolutely amazing! 
I've got another clip here. Let's uh, share this little clip. Make sure I pick the right one. There we go. We've got some beautiful shots of the ship. It looks like sunset. And then it looks like you had some visitors playing uh, in the bows. Absolutely incredible. So there's some of those common dolphins. Uh, is that the only time they've been in the bows or have they been regular visitors? Dolphins been regular. For the first few days, uh, the, the common dolphins were always with us just about. Uh, since getting farther out uh, away from the continental shelf, uh, we've kind of phased out of the common dolphins and we've worked in a couple of new species, uh, smaller dolphins like uh, Atlantic spotted dolphins, uh, we had an encounter with Clemens dolphins, and we're still sorting out the ID, but we think also striped dolphins as well. All right, very cool. So we've got Tom and Rodri with us right now, who we, we pulled into our first event to meet. Uh, camera operator extraordinaires will be editing incredible video uh, for the Darwin 200 as it makes its way around the world. And then Grant, I know you'll be probably a regular visitor in these classroom events, so can you formally introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Grant Terrell. Uh, I'm coming to the Darwin 200 Project from Florida in the USA. Um, I, back home, I'm a PhD student and I study birds uh, and their uh, patterns of distribution around the world. Um, so for the Darwin 200 Project, uh, I'm leading our uh, bird and then marine megafaunal surveys. All right, excellent. Well, uh, to those who are tuning in live with us, we're going to switch gears to Q&A very shortly. So if you have any question uh, for Grant, Tom, or Rodri on the ship, now's the time to put those into the chat sidebar. We're also going to bring in Jess again from the uh, National Marine Aquarium. Uh, but before we do, 10 days at sea, expeditions are an adventure. They never quite go as planned. So what have been some of the challenges so far uh, on the ship? Wind. <laughs> Rolling, we, you know, we're, we're rolling back and forth constantly. A uh, little sleepless. <laughs> Some spilt, spilt tea and coffee. Oh yeah. <laughs> the soup course is a mess. <laughs> <laughs> so I know. <laughs> oh, excellent. Well, it looks like the weather's incredible today. Um, how is the wind today? Are you guys moving along? Or is it kind of a slow go today? I think we're making about seven knots right now, which is uh, a little under, you know, schedule, but, but pretty good for, for all just on sale. All right. And then, um, you know, Charles Darwin, when he was on the Beagle, he was particularly seasick at the beginning, but I don't think he ever, he ever overcame it throughout the entire voyage. I think it plagued him throughout the, the five year journey. So did anybody have to kind of, overcome their seasickness to begin the journey? Mostly it's been all right, I think, actually. Um, we've had a few people that have been feeling a bit worse for wear, but overall, I think the crew's been pretty happy and the seas have been pretty calm. All right, excellent. And I think um, you guys had uh, a little storm situation came up, so you did a little, a little sheltering in Spain. Where did you guys stop? 
We stopped on the north coast of Spain. Uh, there was a, a little sheltered bay at a port town there called Carreño. Uh, it was really cool. It was so unexpected. And we got to uh, take a trek uh, for the day up one of these mountains and uh, ended up uh, by the, the local lighthouse there and got to look down and see you know, all the nesting seabird colonies there. Really cool. All right. Absolutely amazing. So heading towards Tenerife, the Canary Islands, what do you think the next few days are going to look like? What's the plan? Uh, it looks like the wind's going to die a bit, so we're going to have to take down the sails tomorrow morning, I believe, but should be into Tenerife sometime around just after sunset tomorrow. Oh, wow. There we go. That'll be exciting. We look forward to any footage that comes from that. I'm sure the drone will go up. Uh, yeah, no, yeah cool. very exciting. <laughs> All right. Well, guys, if you want to stick around for another minute, um, we can do a little Q&A action. Uh, if anybody else would like to join in, if Nadia or anybody would like to pop in and say hello, of course, they're more than welcome. Um, but we'll start taking a few questions. I'll bring the the aquarium in as well. Awesome. There we go. There we go. We've got someone there. Uh, how are we doing? Oh, you're going to pass it down. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm one of the passengers on the trip. It's been It's been just absolutely fascinating to have these guys on board. I've learned loads about seabirds already, and I can distinguish three different types of shearwaters. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Two, two types of gull, I think. Yeah. So have you been taking That's part good. in some, some of the science? Have you been able to do some trawling for the plastic, looking for marine life, seabirds and things like that? Yeah, yeah. Well, we're all sort of involved in spotting. If we, if we spot birds, then we, uh, we give Grant a shout. And uh, we've been lucky to see loads of dolphins. So obviously it's great to have people on either side of the ship. Um, so as soon as you see dolphins and one of the one of the guys from um, from the Netherlands spotted the whales. So that was pretty exciting. We've heard some whales at night, but we, it was too dark to see them. Um, but it's great having because of the watch system. Somebody's always around, always on the lookout for for exciting things to spot. Amazing. Let's take a quick pan up into the rigging of the sails for a moment. And I'm wondering if you've had a chance to, to get up there and, and help sail the ship. You've been up, Tom? Yeah, so. there yes, you go. You've been up the rigging. Oh, right, yes. No, we went, I went up yesterday with the camera and got some cool shots looking down of some people climbing up. So that will all be released soon. But yeah, no, it's an awesome view from up there. All right. Very cool. So incredible. This signal... Uh, is better than some of the video calls that I do for my cell phone sometimes. This, <laughs> this signal that we're getting through this this Starlink unit uh, is absolutely incredible for where we are on the Atlantic. Absolutely amazing, guys. Awesome. Yeah, I know. It's better than my Wi-Fi at home. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, okay, well, let's switch gears to some Q&A action. Uh, we've got Jess backstage as well. Let me pop her in to say hi. Hey, Jess, how are you? I'm really good, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for that amazing uh, coral reef chat, for the demonstration, and of course to your colleagues who are so so good with their time to be those polyps for us and help with that demonstration. Very cool. All right, so we've got a few questions coming here via the chat. Anything about coral is fair game now that we have Jess with us here from uh, the Ocean Conservation Trust. If you have any questions about what's going on on the ship, now is the time. So we do have a few questions here. Sonia, Sonia's wondering if in Tenerife, if there'll be any activities open to the public, are people able to maybe visit the ship? Do we know? Yeah, no, I think there should be an open ship, but we'll have to find out. And um, So one thing that I would add is that uh, whenever anybody from the public is coming up, you know, it's a great time to educate them about, about the project. We have brochures to hand out. Uh, you know, we also have an information uh, sign that we will display where the ship is docked at port. Um, and that way, anybody who wants to can get on board and, and, you know, track the progress of this project as we're going around. All right. Excellent. And I mean, it's just worthwhile to come down to port, say hello, uh, see the ship. Uh, she is a beautiful historic uh, vessel. I quite enjoyed the chance to see the ship and, and get on board uh, when it was in Plymouth. Absolutely awesome. So we have Mrs. Exton joining us. And Mrs. Exton is wondering if there's been any challenges that you didn't expect 
uh, that you've had to overcome, maybe with technology, maybe with the watch system or any of the, the science uh, experiments? I'd say the biggest challenge we've had so far is finding space for everything. <laughs> and we, we've got a load of camera equipment, science equipment, and it's, it's just been a real challenge to try and stash it all away. <laughs> supplies for two years. Sure. Yeah. We have to eat. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's important. And Roger and Tom, I do apologize for sending you guys below deck a few times to dig things out. I know space is at a premium. Uh, yeah, but I'm sure you'll get a system where you have all the camera gear and the things where yeah. you know where you need it and where you can get to it really quickly. Yeah, no, for right. sure. We'll send photos when it looks a bit tidier. <laughs> all right. So Jess, we've got a question here uh, about the aquarium. Uh, and um, wondering about the amount of coral uh, and what it's like to keep that coral healthy and and thriving. That's a really good question, Joe, yeah. Um, so we have a few different species of corals. We've got a selection of the harder branching corals. We've got some softer corals. And we tend to keep it in our bio area, specialized in those tropical reef species. Um, we do also have some cold water corals, so we've got some pink sea fans. One particular thing, because they're a local coral, they're a colder water, temperate water coral. Um, and they're something, again, we're doing a lot of research with to try and improve um, what we know about how to, how to grow these corals. So that we can work with other organisations like our local universities, um, at helping to rewild a bit the seafloor and helping those uh, populations locally recover because that's so important for a lot of local species of like juvenile fish and seahorses and things like that. So that's one of my particular favourites. Now, um, with, in terms of taking care of them, as uh, Heather may have said, that they're quite picky. They're actually really, really picky and they're very difficult to take care of. So ranging from things like the balance of the minerals that are needed in the water where our biologists need to test that, taste things like uh, the balance of magnesium um, and calcium and all sorts of other minerals every single day, um, to the temperature, the salinity, the acidity, they need the right amount of light coming through and the right kinds of light. How pure is the water? Is it well aerated? All of these things have, have a massive impact. Even, I've discovered fairly recently, the, the, the direction of the current that is flowing in the tank. So if they go, the current is a certain speed and it's going a certain direction, the corals will prefer that. And that varies, again, dependent on the species. So what's really exciting is that we can give those species some of that individualized care that they need um, when they are with us here, here in the aquarium. And, and share that knowledge further afield. All right, very cool. So there's a question here about what's behind you. Is that a marine mammal skull and what is it? It is, yeah, really, really well spotted. So this is the skull of a beaked whale. Um, we do have a variety of different artifacts here at the aquarium. I'm just gonna scoot actually so you can have a proper look at it. Um, a variety of different artifacts here at the aquarium that we use for our teaching. All right, very cool. And one last quick question for you, Jess. We think about coral in warm water environments. I think that's how most people think about coral. But are there any cold water or deep water species that can be found around Plymouth? Oh, that is a really good question. So um, the cold water species that we would tend to find in this area would be things like that pink sea fan. Um, there are some other species that we would find. There are a lot of species that would be found um, in those really deep water areas. They're really exciting. They're a little bit different. They don't have those zooxanthids that we talked about. They're so deep that they wouldn't be able to photosynthesize even if they did. Um, but in terms of what is actually around Plymouth, you know what, that's a really good question and one that I don't know enough about yet. And I think it's uh, a good opportunity for me to go and explore and find out. Thank you for that. All right, excellent. Jess, thanks so much. Uh, Rodri, Tom, how tight does the schedule have to be kept on the ship? If the wind isn't cooperating, will you use the engine from time to time to kind of get a little boost to make sure we're, we're keeping a schedule? Well, that's what, that's what we've been doing, is when we don't make enough progress using sail, the, uh, the captain will decide to take the sails down, switch to the engine, just so we can, we can keep pace with the timetable, really. 
All right. And a final question here from online. This might be a tough one. There might be controversy with this one. Who has the best job on the ship, do you think? Oh. That is a tough one. one. Uh, <laughs> Grant, because he's spotting birds. <laughs> I mean, my work is pretty fun. Yeah. I think we're all having such a yeah. good time doing doing all our different roles and getting involved with the ship and it's such a unique uh, unique place to be carrying out all these activities. Are we saying we all have the best job? Yeah, I think so, I think yeah. So. We're all yeah. exceptionally <laughs> privileged and lucky to be here and we're all, we're all living our own dreams. All right. I think that it's absolutely fair to say. I think everybody's playing an important role. It looks like everybody's having fun. Uh, I can't get enough of just watching the ship gently bob up and down and seeing that ocean view in the background. It's absolutely beautiful. Some sun. Oh, you guys are having a great time. Amazing. Uh, okay. Well, it sounds like uh, you've got a busy day. Tomorrow sounds like it's going to be exciting as well. Uh, when it all goes well, we'll see Tenerife. And then our next world's most exciting classroom will take place from in the port in Tenerife. So we absolutely can't wait for that one. And we'll break out our land satellite unit as well and see if we get these beautiful clear connections like we're getting with our maritime unit. It's so amazing. Uh, okay. Well, Jess, I want to say a huge shout out. Thank you so much for joining us uh, from the aquarium, from the Ocean Conservation Trust. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you. And Ooster Scalde, wow. Absolutely amazing. Enjoy the rest of today. I hope tomorrow goes smoothly. We can't wait for our next connection when we're in Tenerife. Awesome. We'll see you guys there. All right. We'll talk to you guys backstage for now. Thanks so much, everyone. All right. Well, before we do sign out from today's event, we have one more special segment called Curiosity of the Week because we just love giving away prizes to classrooms um, and we love making challenges for classrooms. And this Curiosity of the Week is something we're going to do, a little video clip at the end of each event, and then you kind of have the week to try and identify what this curiosity is. Uh, so let's play a little video clip, then I'll tell you where you can send in your answers. So give me a moment here, and here it comes. This week's curiosity are these objects here. What do you think these might be? If you look very carefully, they're bands covered in hundreds and hundreds of little cowrie shells. There's got to be several hundred on each of these bands. They're not necklaces and they're not jewellery. Can you work out what these are? Join next week's World's Most Exciting Classroom to find out. All right. Well, Stu has given us a few little hints there to get you started. Um, you need to send those answers into classroom at darwin200.com. So I'll pop that up here in a little banner. Classroom at darwin200.com. Get your answers in if you think you can identify the curiosity of the week. Uh, and then we will share that answer with you very likely in our next event from Tenerife, our next world's most exciting classroom. All right. Well, this has been an absolute whirlwind of an event. We've had Stu joining us in pool. We visited... Uh, the Ocean Conservation Trust and the National Marine Aquarium in Plymouth. We had our first experiment on ocean acidification. We learned so much about coral today and our first live uplink to the Ooster Scale Day was such a success getting to see Tom, uh, Rodri, uh, and Grant and meet some other crew members on board of the ship. We would not be able to do this without our sponsors. Without the sponsors, the generous partners who have made the Darwin 200 possible. And that's how we'd like to end uh, today's event by sharing a little clip thanking our sponsors. All right. Well, huge shout out to everybody who joined us live today. Uh, of course, this is being recorded. You can tune into the event anytime uh, on the YouTube channel. I want to give a shout out. We had people joining us from Spain, from the Canary Islands, uh, from Turkey, from 
the UK, from India, uh, places all over the world. So it's so great to see such uh, a great audience joining us from all over the world. Don't forget to head over to darwin200.com where you can find the map and see some of the up-to-date photos and images. You can follow on social media. Searching Darwin200 will bring it up on most places like Instagram uh, or Facebook or Twitter. And then, of course, uh, if you were tuning in as a classroom, try the experiment over the next two weeks. Share your results with us. If you visit the website, you can find the recording. You can find the PDF instructions. It is all there for you. Thank you so much to everybody who joined us for the world's most exciting classroom. And we can't wait to see you next week from Tenerife uh, in the Canary Islands. For now, though, we are going to sign off. Thanks so much, everyone. <laughs>